Hi, I'm Ravinder Jeet Singh at MS4 at Indiana University School of Medicine, and I'm going to talk about carpal tunnel ultrasound. So my objectives will be go over the background and anatomy, a brief review of the literature, some indications for the study, giving an example of going through the study as well as the protocol, and finally, an example of some pathology. So briefly, the anatomy of the carpal tunnel is depicted here, where the transverse carpal ligament or the... Uh, Flexor retinaculum uh, forms the superior border of the carpal tunnel. And then in the carpal tunnel, we see we have a lot of uh, tendons along with the median nerve. And in carpal tunnel syndrome, we'll see that this nerve either gets compressed or bothered such that there's some inflammation around it. And people will develop symptoms of pain or tingling or altered sensation in the distribution of the median nerve in those lateral three digits as shown here in this figure. And there's some physical exam maneuvers we can do to give us a sense of if someone has a carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, one is this Palin sign shown here where we can just kind of tap over the median nerve and see if that elicits symptoms. And the other is the Phelan uh, sign where we have people sort of fold their arms together as depicted here and sometimes that can elicit symptoms as well. So briefly looking at the literature, there was a meta-analysis done that showed that the cross-sectional area at the carpal tunnel inlet of the median nerve seemed to be predictive of someone having a carpal tunnel syndrome. And I like this uh, meta-analysis in particular because they looked at different cutoff points for the cross-sectional area of that median nerve and seeing how the sensitivity and specificity change with that. Uh, we can see, you know, if you use an eight millimeter squared uh, cutoff, that you're going to have a pretty low specificity. So, going to have a lot of false positives there. Uh, clinically, um, I've seen a lot of people use 10 and 12 as a cutoff, meaning anything less than 10 millimeters squared is more likely to be normal, and anything greater than 12 millimeters squared is more likely to be abnormal. And just looking at the numbers, if the uh, median nerve if it has a cross-sectional area greater than 12 millimeters squared, it's pretty unlikely to be a false positive considering how high our specificity is. We can see a 10 millimeter squared, we have a pretty good sensitivity and specificity if you're greater than that for you, I'm gonna have a carpal tunnel syndrome, but uh, between 10 and 12 sometimes is kind of considered to be equivocal. Uh, of course, we have other data sources we're using, such as our to start exam and our history, to help kind of guide us through making our diagnosis. But these are some numbers to give a sense how with ultrasound, when we measure that cross-sectional area, what that tells us about the likelihood of someone having a carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, another more recent literature view looked at how the cross-sectional area of that median nerve uh, corresponded with severity as defined by electrodiagnostic studies. So that's our EMGs and our uh, nerve conduction studies. And we see mild cases will have a cross-sectional area of around 11.64, and then the moderate and severe cases will have these larger cross-sectional areas. So just another indication that this cross-sectional area of the median nerve is a good uh, sort of uh, diagnostic finding we can use to help guide ourselves in detecting a carpal tunnel syndrome. And we can see this 11.64, which is a likely a mild case, kind of falls in that equivocal region, but of course we'll have our exam history and other findings to help kind of guide us on our diagnosis. So our indications for doing an ultrasound will be to evaluate for carpal tunnel syndrome. So in particular, we're looking if someone has complaints of hand weakness, pain, or abnormal sensation, particularly in those lateral three digits. So for our scan, we're gonna to wanna to use a linear probe. That's our high frequency probe. That'll give us a pretty good resolution. Uh, we're gonna place the patient's wrist in a supine position, maybe slightly extended to around 120 degrees. Uh, you can consider using Doppler flow uh, around the median nerve during this. It can give you another indication if there's a inflammation in that carpal tunnel, or particularly around the median nerve. And our goal here is to help us rule in around carpal tunnel syndrome and just as always being mindful of results that seem equivocal and we can always rely on other uh, testing such as electro electrodiagnostic studies to help guide us with diagnosis if we feel are necessary. We're starting here down the wrist. So right here is the median nerve. Um, we can see the flexor retinaculum there on top of it. There we're seeing the scaphoid and the, so the pisiform here and the scaphoid on the other side. And really that's a good spot, uh, you know, seeing the flexor retinaculum and those two bones there, that's a good place to consider that you're at that inlet of the 
of the carpal tunnel, and that's a good place to go and take your cross-sectional area of the median nerve. Now, sometimes you can confuse the median nerve with these other tendons here. So one thing to help do there is kind of track further proximal and find the median nerve more proximally. And here, you know, you could go even further up. And then as you come down, you can keep tracking that median nerve and watch it come up. There it is. And, and you can see that the nerve also has this more sort of not like cookie cut appearance, kind of like a chocolate chip cookie appearance that can be also helpful in identifying it. But we can also go more proximal and scan down to kind of find it. And here we're taking a measurement, the cross-sectional area of the median nerve there. And in this particular uh, patient uh, we had or participant, he had an area of about 10 millimeters squared. So right there kind of at our upper edge of kind of telling us that this is likely not a carpal tunnel syndrome. And of course, in this case, the participant had no symptoms, so did not have any findings of a carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and here is just an example where we can use Doppler. Uh, you can see while the probe is being moved, we'll see flow, but as the, as the probe is nice and steady, we see there's no flow around this median nerve in the carpal tunnel, suggesting there's no inflammation there. So that would be just another negative finding to and then finally, we can also use ultrasound to guide doing a carpal tunnel injection. So here we see a needle coming in through the uh, radial approach. So we'll go ahead and play this. And when we can see when we're doing a, an injection, we wanna get under that flexor retinaculum there and really try to inject between that and the median nerve and under the median nerve as well. We wanna try to surround the median nerve with our injection if we can. So here we have the our needle getting below the flexor retinaculum and we're injecting that fluid there and in between the flexor retinaculum and the median nerve. And finally, a brief example of uh, the pathology here is the cross section of a median nerve that measured 11 millimeters squared. And this was someone who was symptomatic and did indeed have a carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, these are my references. Uh, thank you for your attention.